Alright, so, first off, we are talking about Viking martial arts. How do we know they were using martial arts anyway? How can we, or how do I know they were fighting in a specific way? Well, they optimized they, their way of fighting according to the weapons they got, the, the armor they got, and the opponents they fought against. Yeah, but... Plus, plus to maximize the chance, exactly. chances of survival. Exactly, but all of this is conjecture. Yeah? So anything I say now is basically an educated guess. But I'm going to give you my reasons, and uh, you can decide for yourself if you feel this is sound or no. So, for the later Middle Ages, we do have actual sources. We do have uh, the Solomon, the five books, that tell us about the use of specific weapons. Also, um, on horseback, in armor, um, unarmed fighting as well. There's uh, the so-called ringen, wrestling, that we see in the, in the historical fencing treatises too. And um, they are they're quite specific about how to do things. And what's also interesting is um, they are, in a sense, they are holistic. You can see um, you can see particular moves, particular concepts come up and appear over and over again. And this is very enlightening. Yet this is some uh, 200, 300 years after the Viking Age. So the first treatise that we have is the so-called 133. 133 is a the signature of the. Royal libraries who uh, by now have this treatise. Um, and uh, this is about sword and shield too, but it's about sword and buckler. But a buckler is a little fist held shield, it's a specific set of weapons that was very popular in the late 13th and 14th century. And the whole the whole uh, treatise, which consists of uh, 64 pages, is all about buckler fighting. Do they wear armor? No armor. Do you see any more than two people fighting each other? No. So this is about dueling only. And it's unarmored dueling. Of course, at the time, there were a lot of other contexts when, uh, for weapon use. So this is dueling, possibly judicial dueling, because we still have some law codes from the period that give us the exact regulations for judicial duel. So in um, Germany, for instance, when there was a lawsuit and they uh, were discussing evidence and they come to a dead end, there was the option of uh, fighting a judicial duel. And uh, this may well be the context of this particular book, although it's quite mysterious that... Um, you see the head of this guy here? Yeah, can you tell the others? Mm -hmm. He looks like a monk. Yeah, well, at least like a cleric. Uh, he doesn't have a uh, he doesn't have a monk's habit, but uh, he is uh, tonsured. Tonsured, yeah. Yeah, tonsured. Tonsured. Yeah. Tonsured. Yeah. Okay. So it's a cleric, kind of strange. Uh, so there's some mystery regarding this particular um, this particular manuscript. Also, uh, what's remarkable. Yes, say that again. Ladies fighting. Yeah, so um, this is the only, the only fight book that on its last two pages uh, shows uh, a female fighter. And uh, you know, uh, is this, do we have to take this literal? Is this just symbolic? All a matter of discussion. However, um, judicial duel. If this was the context for Sword and Butler, what other contexts at the time could you think of when weapons were drawn, say for judicial duel? On the street? Yeah, like self defense? Streets by drawers, right? Military. The military, we would expect armor as well. Drunkenness? What? Drunkenness? Drinking? Too much drinking? No. Okay, a brawl, yeah. There are actually, there are actually uh, historical images of uh, brawls where you can see guys um, who are described as being drunk 
with long swords hacking at each other. One is already lying on the ground with multiple cuts on his body. It's quite interesting that all of them have a number of injuries. So there are not these massive uh, injuries that um, when we, I mean, I'm not a gamer, but when I see uh, stills from, from, from uh, video games, they're oftentimes there are these massive attacks and uh, massive blows and guys cut in half. There are uh, sources that describe this too, but um, if you look at the images that appear to be more realistic or the context, Brawl was probably always uh, a very realistic context for using violence at any age. Um, then it looks like uh, there are multiple wounds rather than one decisive wounds, almost as if they were, I wouldn't say timid, but very careful. So you'd rather, you'd rather uh, risk that your strike or your thrust is not incapacitating, but at the same time you are safe. While a lot of people so enthusiastic or so fascinated by the Vikings. What do you like about Vikings when it comes to fighting? I like the armor. Okay, you like the, the, the period and the armor and the, oh, the light armor. Oh, the light armor. Okay, so oh, the uh, light of it. <laughs> okay, so uh, because um, it feels more energetic and um, uh, the movements are not blocked in any way or are not supposed to be. Hmm. Yeah. So we all have these yeah. ideas about. Um, how they might have fought, even if we don't think about it uh, in a, say, academic way, we have an image in our minds. And um, often when, uh, when I talk to people or when I meet people, um, I'm confronted with the idea that uh, on the one side, you have the, the Viking who is like the last heir of the Germanic world, and um, he's the... Uh, the free individual who, uh, who has a sword and uh, uh, fights for his right and for uh, bonds of loyalty and uh, it's more like the noble barbarian in contrast to those crooked Byzantines and all these, uh, Christ these, these um, warriors of uh, Christian realms which fight in rigid formations and wear a lot of armor and things like that. So there's this, this um, uh, idea of a more hands-on approach to, uh, to sword fighting that uh, I'm oftentimes confronted with. Now let us see how likely is it. Um, you said we, uh, we have, I already said we have um, physics and anatomy, okay? So this is one of the, one of the things that we can look at. Um, you said we have the weapons. The, there are still a lot of artifacts from the period, and um, all of you know that these weapons are masterpieces. Yeah, I mean those blades are just fantastic. Uh, all the craftsmanship, ex expert craftsmanship that went into it, and um, they are often splendidly adorned. I just recently saw um, a Viking sword uh, that was found at uh, Viskiauten at uh, the Baltic, not too far away from here. Today that's in... No, it's not Poland, it's Kaliningrad today. Um, and uh, it has this inlaid wires, silver wire and copper, creating fantastic geometric designs. Just crazy, that's the, the work that went into it. So, uh, and, we, and we know from from uh, we know from stories that they tell. What stories did they tell? What stories do we still have? Yeah, we have the sagas. What else? Yeah, and uh, also we have, if you look at it at a wider scope, uh, then we have um, a lot of Anglo-Saxon <coughs> poetry. We have a lot of heroic poetry from the early Anglo-Saxon period where they talk about uh, fantastic uh, swords. So here is a sword which is, has always been difficult to make and therefore extremely expensive and very very valuable at the same time at the same time it's extremely delicate all of you have been to museums you have seen the thickness of these blades and particularly the thickness of these edges the thickness is actually not the right word for it it's just super delicate yeah? you can easily easily destroy a viking sword 
If you want to destroy, and actually, uh, this is what they did with a lot of their swords. Yeah? Have you seen, uh, I mean, uh, typical Germanic style <laughs> burials where the weapons were killed, um, where they were bent, and then uh, the finds from, it's predating the Viking era, the finds from Illerup uh, and Korsberg and Nydam, the swords were actually hacked to pieces. Well, not to pieces, but they're mighty notches. And they don't come from they don't come from combat. They come because they first uh, um, put the stuff into the fire, so it became weak, uh, become, became soft, and then they hacked into it probably with an axe. You can easily destroy a sword. Like uh, here's an image I brought for you. This shows, uh, I'm going to pass this around and uh, also in, uh, in, the, in the break you can uh, look at the images that I brought with. I'm going to put them on the table here. So this is, uh, this is a, a pattern welded sword as you can see. And within, the red, within this red circle there is a piece of the opposing edge still sticking in that blade. Okay, so this is this is what happens if you whack an uh, authentic sword, a sharp sword, into another sword at a right angle killer degree. This was probably not meant to happen <laughs> because this both swords are fucked afterwards. You can't use them anymore. They're going to break next time there's some stress on the blade, they're going to snap exactly there. So sword, uh, uh, what, what else can you use a sword for except for fighting? Ceremonies. Duel. Uh, duel is fighting too. Ceremonies, yeah. Burials. Burials, listen. In a sense, this is... Uh, yeah, status. status. Yeah, decapitating a cow. That's not very graceful, but it would work, I suppose. To show your status? To show your status, that's right. Yeah, of course. And um, this is what uh, some of the people said uh, at the class in Oxford recently. Um, yeah, well, maybe they were not that, they, they did not have sophisticated martial arts, but you could still show your status. So if you live in a society where uh, the kind of fighting that is being used, say in Iceland, Iceland wasn't, didn't even have an aristocracy, that was just farmers. Um, they carried swords as a symbol of status, and all the violence, all the fighting was more or less homebred, so the father showed the son how to do something, and that's it. Possibly. But, um, when, you live, when you live in a society where sword fighting is a reality, you grow up with the stories of these fights. We know from the sagas that every household knew stories about somebody who was killed or maimed in combat. And um, you would, from, from early age on, you would see the adults training, you would possibly see a violent encounter, and you would also see what the victims looked like. And the women, they, even if they would never pick up a sword, they would still know what a sword could inflict they would have to stitch up the injuries, you would have to see uh, to the wounded. And we know that a lot of people survived wounds because there are grave finds, uh, and you could see skeletal trauma, and you can tell that they actually survived uh, really drastic wounds. Not all of them did. I brought you some pictures of uh, some of those who did not. <laughs> Okay, so here's, uh, here are some, uh, there, there, are plenty, there are plenty of examples, these are, these are but a few. Um, these are from the Viking Age, so uh, here's a sharp cut into, uh, into, I think it was a lower leg, so it cut into the bone, um, that, was, that was the very tip of the sword. Apparently here is a slice of uh, the skull that was clean cut from the head. Um, <coughs> what's the mean wound this guy suffered from? Uh, lost his nose. No. <laughs> <laughs> I lost his nose. The upper jaw. Look at the upper jaw. 
Yeah. The upper jaw is cut off, and the teeth are pretty much the hardest uh, part in a human body. So this cut went right here through his front teeth. Um, and he has another cut on his forehead. But the upper jaw, do you think this was a massive blow? That there somebody had to really... That's a really interesting question. Keep that in mind. We're going to come to that later. And um, here's a guy who's... Uh, this is in Moscow Museum. You can look at that next time you're in Moscow. Uh, that's, this part of the stool is missing, so a large chunk of his face was cut off. And here's a guy from uh, Visby. Famous medieval battle fought in 1361. And that was a town militia facing professional... Danish warriors invading, and uh, his face is cut through from one side to the other. His, the, uh, the skull was still found in his male coif, so that didn't do him any good. <laughs> can pass this around to him. Okay, so, um, so, so this is my question. So if you are living in a society where sword fighting uh, is a reality, and where things like that happen, uh, you will gain expertise only by listening, even at very young age. Who hates football? <laughs> okay? Okay, so you hate football. Do you know what a penalty shot is? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. How many people are there of 13? 11. Okay. I hate football too. I can even describe an upside spalle. I don't know the English expression. <laughs> But so, uh, being exposed to football all my life, even though I totally have zero interest, I know so much about football. What I'm saying is that um, what we forget when we talk about um, historical martial arts is that the sheer exposure to the reality already gives you a lot of knowledge. And you will not question when the veteran tells you, you strike in this and this fashion and you hold your shield like this and this, because he's a survivor. How often can you commit a mistake in true combat? None. How many double kills will you survive? None. How many of these people who committed mistakes will leave an imprint on the fighting system? None. It's only the survivors. It's the survivors who know how to teach the others because they know how to prevail in combat. At the time of the Vikings, we, were, uh, we are looking at 3,000 years of sword fighting. 3,000 years. Yeah? It's, it just doesn't make sense to assume that a society that embraces the sword, that is literally obsessed with the sword, had, did not have a refined way of fighting. What comes first? The tool or the craft? If there was a tree in the Stone Age, and they had to cut down this tree, what would they do? Nothing. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I just recently read an article about uh, experimental archaeology, where they cut down a tree with uh, uh, tools that were made from stones and wood. So, uh, basically, proto axes. So the objection is to cut down the tree that persisted through the ages, and the tool was improved yeah? until a point where it could not be improved any further. So axes that we use today don't look particularly different than what a woodworker used a thousand years ago. So the craft, the woodworking skill, that comes first. A uh, Stone Age woodworker knew so much more about wood and about how to work with wood than I will ever do. Same with sword fighting. The sword is a very sophisticated tool. I'll just show you that you can easily destroy it if it's actually... Has anybody ever tried with a sharp Viking Age sword to split a log? It doesn't work. <laughs> it's just... It just... It doesn't work. It's just too thin-bladed. And... So it's no good for anything, save for killing and maiming people. But at this, it's really, really good. It's much better than any other weapon. Because you can inflict injury effortlessly. And effortlessness is one of the crucial words for today. Because in martial arts, your, or martial arts show you the way 
to achieve maximum result with minimum effort. Keep that in mind. Maximum result with minimum effort. Okay? Good. 